The next one is uh, one on the surgical management. Uh, there is quite a lot of involvement of surgeons in an ECMO, even in the ICU. It's really one of those areas where there's an, uh, the interface between surgeons and physicians is actually quite, um, quite strong. Um, I want to call upon my colleagues, uh, Dr. Sundar and Dr. Madan, cardiothoracic surgeons who have been in our group practice, uh, and uh, Dr. Raghunath, the general surgeon, um, Dr. Jairaj, the interventional pulmonologist, Dr. Balaji, the vascular surgeon, everyone's arrived, is it? and Dr. Raj Prabhaka, the uh, ENT surgeon. So. I'm going to start the session by asking uh, Dr. Balaji and Dr. Jairaj. We're going to run this panel uh, discussion through the way an ECMO is done, initiating the ECMO, maintaining the ECMO and its complications, and then the problems that may occur during and after decannulation. So we'll be going across the panel members so that you get a feel for the problems as and when they evolve during an um, uh, ECMO run. The first time usually a surgeon is called, Dr. Balaji and Dr. Jairaj, is when the percutaneous uh, access has failed usually when the patient is hypotensive. Uh, so what, what are your thoughts, both Jairaj and Dr. Balaji, as you called in to have open access or you failed in the percutaneous access during ECMO initiation, whether it's VV or VA? Dr. Jairaj. Um, to begin with, it was a steep learning curve for me too, actually, where we've been able to call to do procedures most often on a relatively stable patient at uh, uh, given time, but for these ECMO patients, it was on the go and often bedside and often in a different centers where we had to go and retrieve these patients. That was a challenge and it was a steep learning curve as well. Uh, we are so much used to sticking smaller tubes into arteries as in the maximum is 10 French and then having to do a percutaneous access for up to 24 French uh, was a bit scary to begin with. Um, the, we, I found that the ultrasound guidance was a lot more useful, especially in VA ECMOs, especially when you want to get the, both the cannulas on the same side, especially in the groins, and also in the distal perfusion axis, which I've got a little talk later on, and I'll share that. Thank you for, first of all, for having me here. The role of vascular surgeons, I think it's widely accepted that they always form a part of ECMO team now. I think it's very well accepted because we all know that uh, limb complications are quite extraordinary. I'm not sure how about 20 years ago or 25 years ago, uh, without looking at this, people have been practicing ECMO. Uh, I've seen a presentation about 15 years ago in Taiwan where the limb complication, both uh, compartment syndrome, uh, ischemias, amputations was as high as 25%, how it was accepted. As you know, when we joined up together, we started off together, and our learning curve has been you know, quite good right from the beginning. <coughs> to answer your questions, when a surgeon should be involved or when we should give up percutaneous, I think the time makes a difference and the experience makes a difference. Um, uh, as uh, Gerard said, Initial ultrasound, I think, will give a good indicator whether it's feasible to do a percutaneous or not, whether it's a vein or artery or whatever. And also, what are you going to do after, like, for example, decannulation? That also has to be in mind when you are putting a percutaneous technique. Vein doesn't matter because you can do a percutaneous and you can do a decannulation by compression. But artery, I feel it's a different kettle of fish, especially when you're going to have a distal perfusion cannulas. It's always going to have an open closure. Even though now, with the closure devices, people are practicing uh, you know, percutaneous technique. So whenever you have a difficulty, I think it's better to go in for an uh, open technique straight away. In open technique, as you know, I'll be presenting uh, some slides during my presentation. Uh, we have both uh, standard open technique or what's called a semi-seldinger or a pseudo uh, percutaneous technique where you open and where you don't do the artery artery and then go with the seldinger's technique. Both of them work very well. And even this literature says by open technique, the limb complication seems to be reduced far better than percutaneous technique, both you know, for cannulation as well as for decannulation. 
I think that's an important point because what we found is if uh, the team prior to that just keeps on poking blindly, uh, even at, if you manage to get on ECMO, when you go in for these repairs, you, we've seen multiple puncture holes in and around that area. So what we do is essentially uh, an ultrasound, a couple of attempts, uh, usually patients are on a lot of inotropes in the VA ECMO or crashing or an eCPR, it's, it's very, very difficult to um, uh, cannulate these vessels. They're constricted quite a bit. So I think an open technique has its role there. Uh, one of the commonest things is during the maintenance, doctor, the question is to Dr. Raj Prabhaka is, uh, you do a tracheostomy, and I think Nick had already alluded to the complications with uh, tracheostomy. Um, I know you're going to give a separate presentation on this, but just in terms of how would you manage bleeding in a tracheostomy in these patients, what's been your experience with, you've done close to more than 110, I think, uh, tracheostomies on patients on ECMO over the years. So really, you know, your thoughts on this. Um, first of all, thanks, Paul, for this opportunity. Um, we were all learning, weren't we? I mean, tracheostomies are probably one of the oldest surgical procedures on the planet, but tracheostomies on uh, ECMO patients, uh, that was a whole, whole different beast. Um, as uh, Dr. Badet mentioned, uh, bleeding is so common in these patients, and uh, the question really is, what do we do about it? Do we intervene? Do we intervene right now or wait for some time? Are there other things we can do? So obviously, um, one of the things that you people uh, made sure was get the coagulopathy as under control as possible in a safe and optimal manner. Uh, and it's always uh, walking a tightrope here because you don't want the patient to, to coagulate either. So. After that is done, if the patient is still bleeding, um, I think we can actually use uh, various techniques, simple things like trying to just pack more tightly around the wound to apply pressure and see if this actually slows down the bleeding. Because uh, if we can slow it down enough that the blood products can be replaced adequately, then maybe we can just sit and watch a while. Um, on the other hand, if it doesn't look like it's going to stop, then we have to try and assess where the bleeding comes from. And uh, I think there is one advantage that we had with these ECMO patients. We could actually remove the tube completely, not have to intubate, and let the ECMO circuit take care of the oxygenation. And this would give us a much better view of the area. We could examine it. And if by chance there was just a single point that was bleeding that could be dealt with fairly easily by cauterization, for example. Uh, but if it was a more diffuse ooze, then it's a combination of cautery, pressure, and uh, a bit of waiting and watching, replacing the blood products and all of that. Uh, we could use endoscopes like uh, that's actually a, uh, an endoscope used in functional and endoscopic sinus surgery. <laughs> that uh, is also, it gives a brilliant picture. So we can actually use that to evaluate the site of the bleeding and the extent of it as well. Um, but in the end, it all boils down to trying to control the bleeding with, with the help of a cautery machine and pressure. Thanks very much, Raj. Uh, Raj has an enormous experience in dealing with these patients and uh, produce some of the best uh, outcomes we've had in terms of bleeding complications. The next question is uh, to Dr. Raghunath. Um, what are the times when a general surgeon is usually called into the ECMO? I know you've been called Bleeding PR. <laughs> uh, you, you know, that's the commonest uh, thing. But then, uh, you know, I just <coughs> wait uh, to hear from you guys saying, yeah, yeah, we can uh, lower the APTT. Apart from that, you know, so if when, it is when bleeding, there's an intra-abdominal bleeding that's suspected you usually, and you come in, or, and no, do you straight away say laparoscopy or laparotomy, or do you wait and watch in an ECMO patient? Is any different how you approach an acute abdomen in an ECMO patient as opposed to, you know, the patient uh, who's not on ECMO on the ward? You might say, let's let's do some white cell, wait wait for a bit and see what the hemoglobin is. Is it dropping? Is there a different approach? To these no, patients. If the patient is on ECMO and you have a patient with an acute abdomen, uh, generally, you know, we get a CT and we are, uh, you know, fairly sure as to what is the cause of this uh, thing. Generally, I find it's uh, retroperitoneal uh, causes. And um, 
any retroperitoneal hematoma, we uh, generally wait and uh, see whether we can manage and whether it will settle. Laparoscopy is uh, out of the question. I also do not like to offer them laparotomy um, because um, I find um, you know, opening the abdomen, decreasing the pressure, will it increase the chance of it bleeding? Um, we can do whatever we need to do in the retroperitoneal approach, uh, and uh, that gives us better uh, chance to, you know, as he was saying, yeah, uh, pressure, uh, pack, and all that. I also pray um, he didn't um, with the tracheostomy. No, that, <laughs> that's true. But I, I, I think the next question is Jairaj and Raghunath. This is a patient we had on the COVID unit who, um, had this kind of fall in hemoglobin and a rising uh, urea, not very clear what was happening. I remember during one of the virtual ward rounds with Nick, we were discussing about this patient, um, and it turned out that he did have a, a retroperitoneal bleed, and the approach was, let's see if we could embolize the uh, lumbar vessels uh, and avoid a, a, a laparotomy or, or a surgical exploration. As it happened from the pictures, you can see that we did it. The broader question I want to ask Dr. Jairaj is, when we think about embolization, a coil embolization, the word is embolization, but these are patients who are on heparin. So is it any different? Is there any data to suggest that it's, the failure rate in ECMO patients with embolization is higher? Is it more difficult to visualize the vessels or easier? What is the overall uh, kind of uh, an interventional um, a radiologist's point of view of ECMO patients as, as regards these embolization for bleeding conditions? Um, there are three issues with this. One is getting a diagnosis as to what's happening inside the abdomen. And the second is getting a clearer picture as to a, a roadmap as to what to do. And third thing is how we're going to do it. Um, diagnosis was difficult because most of these patients are lying supine. They can't be easily shifted in and out. And so we relied heavily on ultrasound as a screening tool to, I've never examined a retroperitoneum so much in detail before in my life, like in ECMO patients, where we also learned more and more in that. So we started to pick up even the subtle hematomas in the retroperitoneum. And once a hematoma was identified on ultrasound, we did a serial ultrasounds for two or three days and kept a close watch on the hemoglobin. And if you think there was continuing to be increasing in size or the drop in hemoglobin, then we would take the patient for a CT scan. We did a CT angiogram and then identified the site of bleed. Even in a normal patient, a retroperitoneal hematoma, we often don't see the site of bleeding because often they are venous bleeds. And just by controlling their coagulopathy, it stops. But it was a big challenge in ECMO patients. And this particular patient with this image, we, after a lot of deliberation, we decided to take him up for embolization. And it was a challenge because the vessel that you're seeing there is an intercostal vessel. And these vessels, usually we just tend to embolize with gel foam. That's a temporary embolic agent, which occludes it for a couple of weeks. But as we embolized these and they got occluded completely, we then went on to the other vessels and came back and repeated the angio at the same sitting. These co continued to recanalize. So we had to end up with uh, embolizing them with permanent embolic agents such as particles in there. Thank you. Next question is Dr. Madhan, who is a veteran of uh, many ECPRs. Uh, the question is, uh, I mean, you'd, uh, I, I've, uh, I want to um, talk about two patients on whom you did ECPR. One was somebody with COVID who was on BV ECMO, who came off, was absolutely fine, and then there was a sudden uh, surge of like, temperature and PCO2, and he had a cardiac arrest. And uh, I think you and Dr. Sundar uh, opened his chest and went on central VA ECMO. And another patient who was a um, out-of-hospital arrest post-lung uh, transplant who had a massive hemoptysis, um, who came in and was resuscitated for an arc successfully with a peripheral VA ECMO. The question I want to ask you is, when would you kind of say, I'm going to do a peripheral VA ECMO, or when would you escalate to central VA ECMO during an ECPR? Thank you for the question. Like, uh, uh, it depends on the cause of the uh, arrest. So uh, first patient, what you're talking about, I clearly remember, it's a VV ECMO patient in the ICU setup, uh, decandidated, and uh, we need to, uh, uh, his uh, CO2 and all are going up. We have decided to recandidate with the 
or do you live in Kerala? Kerala. So we place that Kerala in the IJV and then uh, under uh, echo guidance. So as we are doing it, uh, there are some uh, blood collection around the heart and uh, the, there was a cardiac uh, tamponade and then the patient arrested. So uh, uh, in those kind of situation, we have to arrest the bleed and there is some bleed in the heart. So we have to open the chest and then uh, arrest the heart. This is a controlled environment because you are in the ICU and I am able to get uh, help quickly and then uh, just open the uh, patient and uh, there was a bleed in the RV. I just placed the hand and then uh, started resuscitating. Patient came up and then uh, we placed the ECMO and came out. So that's how uh, that patient was managed and uh, we initiated within a matter of say uh, 20 minutes uh, the whole procedure is over. The ECMO, uh, v -ECMO so we, uh, the CPR, uh, ECPR. So the other patient, uh, yeah, post uh, lung transplant patient, who had a bleed in the post, uh, uh, at home, like uh, he was doing fine and discharged. And uh, he was on tracheostomy though, on a very little pressure support, but had a massive hemoptysis, came back here. And we did a bronchoscopy. I'm not able to find the bleeder in uh, both, uh, I'm not able to identify this is a particular area of bleed. So uh, we want to do a CT scan to uh, see uh, is there any other uh, cause going on or else uh, to see whether there is any uh, embolizable vessels. So we took him to the CT scan. In the CT scan, he had a bout of bleed and a cardiac arrest. So this is uncontrolled environment. Also, it happened in the, almost in the middle of the night. So uh, uh, first initial thought is uh, we'll uh, succor the blood and the patient should come out. We tried all those things. Uh, it didn't come out. The CPR was going on. And next thought, what was uh, going on in our mind is uh, to place an ECMO or not. The 15 to 20 minutes are over. The debate is uh, if you place the ECMO, the bleeding can worsen and you're not going to get the patient out. So if not, the patient is going to arrest. It's a tight situation. So uh, at that time, uh, we decided to place a double human uh, endotracheal tube so that we can isolate uh, both lung. At least one lung can get ventilated and we can uh, save the patient. We did that. And uh, double human tube, uh, the proper bronchoscope will not go. We applied a suction and all. Then also we were not able to uh, resist the patient. And uh, finally, we decided uh, that uh, we'll take a risk and then go for uh, V-ECMO. As I'm uh, doing the double human tube and all, uh, Dr. Jairaj was around. He's kind of place the uh, sheath in the artery and the vein. So uh, we moved on to the uh, VA ECMO immediately. So uh, once we did the VA ECMO, the patient stabilized. Once the CO2 went up or went down, uh, pH and all stabilized and we saved. That's how we managed uh, both this patient. But uh, that time uh, took longer, something like uh, 75 to 90 minutes, I think so. That is because uh, pushing the double human tube trying everything possible to manage the patient uh, without ECMO because he was uh, actively bleeding. Yeah, uh, two more questions. This next one is to Dr. Balaji. This is just really to showcase all the things that could go wrong when you have patients on ECMO for very long. So on an average, we have had patients for nine, 10 months, so I mean for four months, but extending on to even 10, 12 months, about 300. And so you start seeing a whole lot of other complications. This particular patient, uh, I think uh, developed a pseudo aneurysm which you initially repaired and then you replaced with a saphenous vein which had a blowout and then you um, had a bypass done as well and as well as some coil embolization which Jairaj did. What exactly was happening in this patient and, and what do you think was the reason for this complicated outcomes? Thank you, Paul. This is one of the nightmares for a vascular surgeon, I think. Sepsis in vascular surgery itself, it's a huge uh, topic of debate. This a vascular surgeon don't like any infection, wherever it is. It may be an AV fistula or an aortic aneurysm or a fimpop graft or whatever. Because the, the only option is you have to remove whatever. Because what Dr. Ramgopal Krishna is saying, once something gets infected, that has to be removed. Unfortunately, we can't just throw away whatever we want to in these situations. And this patient, uh, because of COVID, he's been on a long-term ECMO. Uh, it was decannulated and the artery was repaired. And that arterial repair got infected, as uh, we discussed earlier, there is a biofilm. And that blew out in the middle of the night. So we did an excision of the vein and then reconstructed. But again, after, typically after a week or 10 days uh, infection, that blew out. That has to be excised. Extra segment of artery was excised. And there is a CFA2. SFA, venous graft, obviously we don't want a prosthetic graft at that stage with an infection inside you. So we did a saphenous vein graft. That again got infected. So the only option we have is uh, do a excision of the whole artery and do what we call an extra anatomical bypass. This what you see is a extra anatomical bypass. 
completely going away from the site of infection, which is a thigh. Here we made an anastomosis to the external leg artery, coming around the hip, going posteriorly, come to the middle of the thigh, do an SFA bypass. Fortunately, this did not get infected, but the groin sepsis persisted. And he went on to form a pseudoneurism of the so-called ligated area also. As we saw it expanding, I think uh, Jairaj was kind enough to go in and put in some coils and glues and everything. That was settled out completely. So this is one extraordinary case which um, I, I have never seen in my life. And I don't think many people survive to get into so many complications. You know, um, Either they get better or they die because of the complication. But this fellow survived so many complications, but of course, unfortunately, succumbed to something else, so I infections. think. Yeah. So the point we're trying to make here is important to involve everybody in the interdisciplinary team early on because the complications, uh, if you want to try and save some of these patients or help them, everyone's got to be on board and not just call them at the time of crisis. Last but not the least, uh, Dr. Sundar, when you're called for an ECMO on a patient who is on a lung transplant list, I mean, these patients are already by the criteria of ARDS and everything, they probably have high carbon dioxide, low oxygen, poor compliance, you name it. What are the criteria that you use when you're going to put somebody on a bridge to transplant ECMO? Yeah, the quick and the short answer is when they go into an acute respiratory failure. Uh, so the whole philosophy is uh, we need to make sure that we don't succumb to what we call mortality on the waiting list. There are a lot of people who are waiting for an organ. And not everyone is lucky because organ is a scarce and a precious resource. So until such time an organ is available, we need to take all the steps possible to maintain the function of the lung. The lung has been diseased completely, no doubt. But the other organs, the other end organs have got to be maintained. We've got to preciously look after the recipient. To that end, when the patient is unable to breathe, the carbon dioxide builds up, the pH comes down to less than 7.2, there is hypoxia, there is threat of you know, hypoxic injury to other organs, we would like to escalate therapy, what we call a bridging therapy. Practically, we go first for a mechanical ventilation, and what we find is the great majority of our patients are ILD, and patients who are mechanically ventilated in ILD, as much as about a third or even 40% of the patient cannot be ventilated because their lungs are scarred. You just can't give enough pressure. So although you intubate them and put them on the ventilator, there is no correction of your respiratory gases at which time we put ECMO. So yes, in terms of your, your question, respiratory failure, we would like to preserve the patient and bridge him to a transplant. Thanks very much. And with that, I think uh, unless there are any questions, we can close the session. Thank you very much.